We want to consider insulin in context, but always remember insulin is increased usually in the post meal window to help your body process the energy that you just consumed. There's not a real need for elevated fasting insulin. So if your insulin level is 12 and your health professional said that's normal because the lab range, now let, let's, this is a great time to pause, okay? What's normal on labs, are, that's normal for what, Amer that's what Americans values are right now. Uh, okay, so what's normal is not ideal or optimal, okay? Because most Americans, 70 plus percent of Americans are overweight or diabetic. We know that I think, you know, Medicare eligible individuals, five in, in six eligible individuals for Medicare have three or more chronic diseases. So you could say chronic disease is normal. That's not optimal or healthy. So we're hearing a lot about metabolic health from metabolic flexibility, insulin resistance, metabolic inflexibility, glycemic variability. There's a lot of terms. And what I would like to do in today's video is share with you a more simplified version, uh, a way to think through this. And we're going to use a triangle for a triad to think about your liver, your muscle tissue, and your systemic glucose uptake and utilization. So what I would like to do is share with you a cheat sheet and a way to think through this and also a video series that you can link below. And hopefully you can download that and check that out and follow that along as we're going through this video. So we're going to talk about your liver and uh, your lipids and then your systemic ability to uptake and utilize glucose. So let's first talk about the liver because the liver is actually the, one of the first and key organs that insulin affects. So when you eat a meal, whether you're eating a low carb meal or a high carb meal, high protein meal, high fat meal, your liver is really active. And that's about, uh, it really crosstalks with, with insulin and it's a key way to ascertain and get a good insight into your body's metabolic health and, and why that's so important. So we're gonna put the liver here and what we're gonna talk about is your liver function test, your LFTs. And there's three different liver function tests that I would like you to pay attention to. Again, in the cheat sheet below, you can download this and request this. Just print this out next time you go to see your doctor. And let's pick apart these three tests and then we'll get into the other tests here. So you're gonna ask for your AST. You're gonna ask for ALT and, and most importantly, in my opinion, is GGT. Now, what are these? These are acronyms for the three different liver function tests alanine aminotransferase, uh, aspartate aminotransferase, and this is a, 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 another transferase enzyme that's involved in actually glutathione levels and glutathione processing. So you actually see this elevated uh, GGT when there is a more systemic need or demand for glutathione. And so you start to see increased glutathione demand when your liver gets infiltrated with fat. So what are the ranges here for these? Well, okay, so this can be units per liter. Uh, basically, you would like these to be under uh, around 25. Now, if your levels are 29, if they're 31, not the end of the world. But because what we want to, again, view this as liver enzymes, lipid levels and then systemic utilization and so forth and, and sort of think about this, you wanna look at everything in context. So this is part of the challenge of this binary way that we sort of view our life. It's good or bad, uh, you passed or you failed, okay? We wanna view things in context and this is how we can get a better assessment of your metabolic health. So the first thing we're gonna do is look at the liver. The second thing we're gonna do when you do your lab work, okay, is you're gonna look at your lipids. Now. Um, we can talk about cholesterol and all that, but we're gonna focus here on your trigs, triglycerides, okay? Uh, we'll just put trigs there, okay? We can also add on, it's on the cheat sheet, ApoB. Now, you could also add on LDL cholesterol and HDL cholesterol, but what tends to happen is if our muscle tissue and our systemic uh, you know, intake of glucose and we become more insulin resistant, what tends to happen first is we're gonna get conversion of glucose, so it's gonna be, I'm just gonna put glucose here, glucose into fat, okay? And so what that's going to do, there's enough, your liver is gonna to start to build up fat, and then these liver enzymes are gonna to start to ride, rise. And then what that's going to do is going to cause your triglycerides to increase. So what you're gonna see here is when people's triglycerides, they start to increase around, you know, 80 plus. You know, they're gonna go up to, you know, I've seen them as high as 600 triglycerides. So these things start to really increase. Now, you might wonder, well, where are these triglycerides coming from? They're coming from your liver. So you, again, you start to see this pattern or this cluster, which gives us, if we think about this from a 50,000 foot view of metabolic health, 
you're starting to eat more glucose or eat too much energy, that glucose is being converted by way of de novo lipogenesis from elevated insulin into fat. That fat's being stored in your liver. You're getting non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and then eventually gets to NAFLD. And then guess what? Your liver uh, starts to make more of that fat. Triglycerides increase. And then what happens is your fat cells, which are here, your fat cells start to become enlarged and they can't, uh, you know, store all the all these lipids so then you start to get it's just a big metabolic mess okay so what you're going to do when you go to your doctor get your liver function tests you're going to look at your triglycerides you can add on apob you can do an advanced lipoprotein particle test that will look at your small dense particles to the uh, the, the large fluffy particles and actually do a direct assessment of your ldl and hdl because as we talked about before when you go to Quest or LabCorp and you ask for your lipids, whether you get LDL cholesterol or HDL cholesterol, they're not a direct measurement. It's a freed walled equation. Uh, sorry, but most doctors don't even know that. They think that when you get your blood lipids back, it was a direct assessment. It's an estimate. It's a total estimate. So you want to actually look at ApoB or you could do ApoA1, which is looking at more of the HDL particles, all the atherogenic, the uh, ILD, I. LDL, VLDL, and, and uh, LDL have ApoB. So if you have a lot of ApoB, you have a lot of de novo lipogenesis going on, okay? All that is explained in the cheat sheet. Now, let's not forget, you know, looking at systemic utilization and glucose because about 70% of glucose and much of the post-meal insulin, where is that latching onto? Your muscles, okay? So if you have weak muscles, insulin-resistant muscles, if you have inactive muscles, Guess what's going to happen? Your blood glucose is going to increase. You're going to have higher levels of insulin and you're going to have higher levels of hemoglobin A1C. So that's where we're going here. We're talking about glucose you have here. Then you have your hemoglobin, HGBA1C, and then you have LDH, okay? And you have insulin, okay? So in su uh, lin. All right. So I know my handwriting sucks. Sorry for, uh, for that, but just bear with me here. So now we're starting to get a picture here because I get clients all the time. I get comments. I get direct messages. Hey, Mike, my hemoglobin A1C is elevated. What does that mean? Am I insulin resistant? Am, am I on the path of poor metabolic health? It's like, well, with one biomarker, now that you know this, it makes sense. You're like, oh, well, duh. If you only have hemoglobin A1C, what does that mean for your liver? What does that mean for your lipids and, and cardiovascular risk and fat tissue threshold? You don't really know. So this is why we need to look at things in a network, in an interconnected network that's cross-talking and interacting here. So this is why we have to do comprehensive labs. We can't just look at, oh, let's test your glucose, Sally. Let's, you know, let's look at your you know, insulin, that's it. No, we need to look at all of these in context and consider this, okay? So a one-off high hemoglobin A1C in, without elevations in liver enzymes or triglycerides, I'm not too concerned about that. But if hemoglobin A1C is elevated over 5.5 or 6 range, uh, LDH is, is starting to increase, lactate dehydrogenase. So that just indicates that you're more, your body's uh, in, in, increasing its glucose utilization and metabolism by way of glycolysis. So this starts to increase. So this is an important and I will say very often neglected biomarker, okay? I would say the two most important biomarkers on here that are often neglected, GGT, LDH. Most doctors never run these. So please add them to your, to your lipids or your, your blood work as well as insulin. So we wanna look at this now. I do wanna thank Nasha Winters for helping us better understand this. She has a great book about the met metabolic approach to cancer, I believe is the book. Now let's talk about insulin and then we'll talk about putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And by the way, friends, I haven't introduced myself. I'm Mike Mutzel. Thank you for, be, for being here. If you enjoyed this content, hit that like button. Subscribe to the channel so you get activated and notified when we do more videos like this. And be sure to download the cheat sheet below so you can uh, optimize your health. Okay, looking at insulin, I think it's good to look at this fasting first. I think the first time you do labs, if you haven't done labs in the last several years, just go fasted, get a nice baseline, save it in a file on your computer, the next time you do labs, you can do a post-meal or a post-prandial lab test, which would mean you would have your standardized meal, whatever meal you normally eat. For me, I love a little red meat, little olives, a little kimchi, maybe some mushrooms, something like that. And I wanna see you know, what your body is doing. How do your triglycerides increase in the post-meal state? 
you know, you might test your labs in between 90 minutes and, and 120 minutes after your meal. What are your triglycerides doing? What's your insulin doing? What's your LDH doing? What are your liver enzymes doing? They probably won't change much, but they might. What is your glucose doing in that post meal window? So again, this is where if your doctor said, oh my God, your hemoglobin A1C is elevated. You need to get on X, Z or Y drug right now. You're like, okay, maybe. But if that's fasted, let's also, you know, doc, hey doc, are you willing to work with me if I do 90 days of lifestyle change, if I exercise, if I compress my feeding window, if I go to bed and get off the computer, you know, in the evening time, if I start eating more real uh, unprocessed food, if I manage my stress, you know, give me some time before we consider treatments. There's nothing wrong with drugs per se. But again, we want to look at all of this together. So I know I went through this a little bit fast, but um, I, I think there, it's way easier to understand your health if you look at things from this 50,000 foot view and understand the interrelationships and how things work. Because it's often that we have one elevated marker on a, on a test, it just says high, and then that leads to this automated sort of response by a, a nurse practitioner or a, a, an assistant that says, hey, this person needs this. Okay, it's, it's much more important that we consider this in context. So, that being said, let's talk a little bit more about insulin. There's no real physiologic need for an elevated fasting insulin. If your insulin is elevated fasting, I would say over around four or five units, that means that you might be on this trajectory of hyperinsulinemia. It's, it's not that you're gonna develop any diseases tomorrow, it just means it's something you need to work on. So usually, you know, I'll just say as someone who's been exercising for 20 plus years, eating low carb now since 2014, um, I found my insulin when I tested it, it's like one or two, it's very low. Um, and my glucose, it can fluctuate a little bit, but I'm more concerned again about the triad. Uh, if the glucose is a little elevated, that could be something that, uh, you know, I, I got a bad night's sleep, um, you know, I'm, I'm not as recovered, but as long as triglycerides are low, ApoB is trending right, low insulin, low LDH and liver enzymes are looking good, I'm not all that worried about that, right? So we wanna consider insulin in context, but always remember, insulin is increased usually in the post meal window to help your body process the energy that you just consumed. There's not a real need for elevated fasting insulin. So if your insulin level is 12 and your health professional said, that's normal because the lab range, now let, let's, this is a great time to pause, okay? What's normal on labs, are, that's normal for what, Amer that's what Americans' values are right now. Uh, okay, so what's normal is not ideal or optimal, okay? Because most Americans, 70 plus percent of Americans are overweight or diabetic. We know that I think, you know, Medicare eligible individuals, five in, in six eligible individuals for Medicare have three or more chronic diseases. So you could say chronic disease is normal, that's not optimal or healthy. So elevated insulin is normal, but it's not ideal. Uh, ideal is under five fasting. Uh, and then you could also do post, post meal as well. Uh, so for glucose, we definitely want that under 100. Uh, fasted, definitely, I would say under 150 for post meal. So these are things we wanna consider. Now with triglycerides, if you eat a fatty meal, they should be under 200. I believe it's um, milligrams per DL uh, on triglycerides, so that's there. Okay, so we did a lot of stuff here. We, we talked about a lot. If you, want, if you need to revisit that, that's fine. But this, this cluster of tests here give you a good idea into metabolic health. Now it's important to understand where, to get, this is like a financial analysis for your metabolic bank account, so to speak. Uh, you want, as you get older, metabolic health issues naturally arise. You get more insulin resistant as you age, you get less glucose tolerant as you age, and metabolic health issues lead to cognitive decline. They affect muscle loss, they affect bone mineral density, they affect your cardiovascular system and lead to metabolic health issues, hyperinsulinemia, leads to dysregulated endothelial functioning. So the little functional unit within your blood vessels that allow for nitric oxide vasodilation and, and all of that uh, is, is compromised when you have metabolic challenges. So there's a lot of reasons to consider metabolic health. If you're trying to get pregnant, if you're having you know, uh, fertility issues, if you have polycystic ovarian syndrome, metabolic health is really important and we wanna get a good understanding of our metabolic health issues. So now you have the cheat sheet. If you download the link below and even additional details, you have 
I think, a better understanding about how to view this differently. And I hope you found this helpful. If you did, you can share this video with a friend. You can hit that like button. You can subscribe because we like to bring you cool videos to improve your metabolic health. So we will catch you on a future video and I do check and I read every single comment. So if you have any comments, please leave them below. And if you have ideas for additional videos to help talk about these different nuances, let me know there as well. We'll catch you on a future one down the road. Until then, be well. Bye guys.